it, it was certainly my personal view is a, a large part of why we are where we are is um, you know, we've had a, a sort of 30 to 40 year journey of taking a much more hands off risk based, so called risk based approach to regulation and regulation enforcement. Um, at the same time as taking lots of new innovation and, and new approaches. And, and, you know, in hindsight, the two things should never have perhaps been, we were taking too much risk and more risk than we were expecting or thought we were taking. There is no zero sum game here. There's a huge amount of work needed to be done to, to meet the sustainability agenda and to, to deliver that safely. So I don't think there's, um, a need for us to um, um, hold on and keep trade secrets around some of the things that will just objectively improve um, safety and sustainability at scale. And at our, if we try and we, we, we try and do that uh, where we can, uh, you might have seen in, in recent weeks we've uh, published um, a global design guide on mass timber fire safety design, which is um, relatively high level and quite an entry level. Uh, place for for enabling mass timber um, buildings, um, but it's really important in countries where this is not picked up in, in in guidance at all currently. It gives us a starting point and something that we can build from, and also sets out some of the considerations for when you need to go into you know further stages of design and and more complex buildings. Yeah, 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 yeah. The design guides and uh, yeah, very good. Recommend everyone takes a look at that. Um, you, you mentioned the eighty twenty principle earlier. Could you just explain that a bit to our to our listeners? <laughs> Pareto, um, focus on the twenty percent of actions that will bring about the um, eighty percent of, of of impact. Um, and this is probably that um, uh, discussion point around where we focus discussion on consensus versus where we focus discussion on on, on difference and. Um, as we know, current prescriptive guidance is aimed at um, the common building situations, the more typical, maybe simpler um, building designs. And ultimately, the, um, the the battle, for want of a better word, on the decarbonisation uh, of the built environment is a scale question. It's not about the, the tall one-off towers necessarily. They can absolutely be a big part of the the, the process and can be pathfinder projects in many ways, but we need to have simple, clear, consistent and followable rules that the industry can apply to, to the more, the more typical common scenarios. Um, so that to me is us as an industry focusing on consensus, staying away from the inertia of, 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 of disagreement and the things that will take a lot of time and research to resolve and focusing on helping and produce common common rules and principles for the eighty percent. Yeah, and uh, uh, how do we sort of ensure compliance for for all of this? You know, you you both spoke about how uh, the regulations are quite broad and, and the guidance is is quite prescriptive, and there seems to be a sort of growing gap between between that guidance and and social aspirations for sustainable buildings. Um, Gavin, I don't know if you want to uh, talk a bit on, on on how we can ensure. Yeah, compliance I mean, in, in in large part. It, it was certainly my personal view is that a large part of why we are where we are is um, you know, we've had a, a sort of 30 to 40 year journey of taking a much more hands off risk based, so called risk based approach to regulation and regulation enforcement. Um, at the same time as taking lots of new innovation and, and new approaches. And, and, you know, in hindsight, the two things should never have perhaps been we were taking too much risk and more risk than we were expecting or thought we were taking. Um, so that's a challenge. At the same time, we've had massive reduction in, in, in skills and education in the sector, and particularly on enforcement. Um, so there's lots of myths and misunderstandings um, and ultimately a very thin line of, of building control professionals who um, are, hold it, are holding the line of what is and is not compliant. Um, to me, though, all of that um, has just underscored a big misunderstanding, which is who is responsible. And, and actually, in law, that hasn't changed. It, people may have thought it changed or, or, or thought it was different to what it was. But in reality, it's, the 1984 Building Act is very clear. The person or the organisation undertaking the work is responsible for compliance. Um, just because building control signed something off did not mean... Every, all of it was compliant and it doesn't absolve you of your 
responsibilities as the person undertaking the work to to ensure compliance, as as many people are finding out to their surprise um, in the courts at the moment. Um, so there has to be this shift back to, you know, ultimately we are everyone is responsible for making sure what they do is done correctly, it is compliant, um, and and not seeing what they can get away with, which is um, you know unfortunately a behaviour set which became all too common. I think the changes um, from the building safety regulator uh, following the Grenfell tragedy that are coming through, particularly the duty holding changes, um, the law there, I think will have a transformative effect, but it will probably take a decade to really kick in. Um, but I have hope that that's heading back in the right direction, not least which are because it makes clear and creates consequences for and a range of consequences for the people who are ultimately making decisions. And it's not just relying on this very thin, stretched group of building control professionals um, to check everything and take responsibility for everything. That's not their job. There's been improvements um, and strengthening of the building control as well as, as a backstop. Um, but yeah, the, the, you know, part and parcel of this has to be a new, you know, a, a, a much greater seriousness given to whether or not we're compliant or not. Um, otherwise, people are going to find them in, in themselves in courts and, um, um, and and find out the hard way. Yeah, it sounds like it's been lots of sort of good change happening, but um, uh, there seems to be a need for that change to, to keep happening. Um, Owen, I don't know if you had any, any thoughts on it. Yeah, I think Gavin picked up a lot of a lot of very practical concerns there that we need to tackle. Um, and there's some of them are very linked the the reduction in skills and experience within the sector, um, particularly amongst um, perhaps uh, designers. Um, and that's not for any fault of designers necessarily. It's the fact that they don't have to spend a lot of their time witnessing um, physical installations on site. I'd love to see um, a, a refocus on um, engineers, architects, and, and, and all those involved in putting a design together, having to be involved uh, and part of the process of uh, seeing things through in construction and handover. And we see challenges with this across all kinds of things in the fire safety sector, not just relating to some of the new technology we talked around in terms of uh, new, new forms of construction and, and, gen and energy generation, et cetera, but also in relation to smoke control systems practical stuff such as detailing that that just doesn't um doesn't follow what you see in, in in documentation necessarily so i think that's a that's a big thing we need to think about how we tackle on the back of all of the other changes that are coming through in in legislation and, and, and responsibilities yeah and obviously the research plays a, a big part in this to sort of uh, move things along is there sort of any any research that excites you at, at the moment owen you know you mentioned the uh, Mass Timber uh, playbook that uh, Arapa just released. Is, uh, yeah, is there anything else that sort of excites you that could, could have a big impact? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's quite encouraging to see the amount of um, attention that the interface between sustainability and fire safety is getting in the international community. So um, there are a, a host of, of movements in this area. You'll have seen maybe the, the Frisbee initiative uh, being run out of Slovenia. Um, um, looking at all kinds of sustainable technologies and how we can enable them safely. And they hosted a, a really useful conf uh, conference in, in the autumn on this. The SFPE have, re have produced some, some white papers on 10-year research roadmaps that um, are, are quite high level, but are aiming to steer fire safety research towards practical outcome-focused work that will actually enable the, the, the sustainability transition. Um, and, and yeah, as I mentioned, then there's there's, there's investment across um, various uh, sectors and individual kind of organisations to look at look at look at um, the the practical things we have to enable. Um, another another one, for example, is the the work that Arab tried to pull together um, uh, on behalf of the government on electric vehicle car parking facilities, uh, trying to plug some, some current gaps within guidance there. So yeah, there's research happening happening everywhere, um, and um, I think um, we've got a, a role as a as an industry, um, and I, I mean that beyond fire engineers across across the sector again, as Gavin refers to, to to cut through the noise, to to communicate uh, in both ways what's important, what's actually needed to to be researched to 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 enable the transitions we're talking about, but also to communicate in a in a constructive way, in a transparent way, what is being found by the research um, and how we can um, 
tackle uncertainties and risks then in, in projects and guidance. Yes, yeah, speaking a lot about the sort of the research to to inform guidance and, and inform advice, and then obviously there's research into, into new materials and things, and that could be both far safe and sustainable if they could uh, be then mass, mass produced. And um, Gavin, do you think um, there's sort of uh, any hope for some sort of golden bullet like that to come along, or, or do you think it's it's about sort of working with what we've got and, and researching and finding safe ways uh, to, look, to make uh, it work? More research and more understanding is, is always welcome. I, I don't think there's so, any such thing as a silver bullet. Um, that we, what we need is, you know, lots of things coming through. I mean, one of the things um, that I think is, is, is related to the research side of things, um, but we haven't done arguably anywhere enough of, is, is, is actual physical testing. Um, the robust, impartial, um, independent testing, I think, needs to play a much bigger role. Um, and not just in the supporting manufacturers in their R&D and getting product certification. That's an important part of the process, and that has to be done in a way that engenders trust and, importantly, provides data um, to the engineers to use. Um, but also the availability of testing um, that uh, can support uh, the one-off situations, understanding whether or not something that exists um, is indeed a problem. It might not meet the requirements, but is it a problem? That's a different story. Um, and likewise, to support contractors. Maybe they want to build something that's innovative, want to build something that requires the coming together of elements outside of their tested and certified performance criteria. How do you know if that's um, going to be good. Absolutely, there's a role for fire engineers and other professionals there, engineers to look at this and say, actually, yeah, I think that's going to be fine. I've got the data to justify that. But what about the ones where you're not quite sure? What about if you want to be certain? Actually, why don't you build it, put it in a lab and test it? Now, obviously, these things take time and cost money um, in ways that we perhaps haven't um, done in the past. But it's, it's truly the way you get confidence, trust and data back into the marketplace. And that's one of the roles and one of the things that FPA is going to be investing in heavily for the future, because we think this is going to change, is one of the areas that's going to really change. We think it's one of the th key capabilities that the market needs more of in, in order to enable the right behaviours in the broader sector. Um, and so we're putting our money where our mouth is on that one. Um, and we hope plenty of other people do as well.